I thought we will. Ah, perfect. We will begin with um, a couple of case studies from the region. Um, talk about our motivation and goals for focusing on cybersecurity. I want to share a little bit about myself and why it is that I'm interested in this topic and and some of my expertise in this area. Uh, in the second part of the presentation, I want to share data on recent threats and trends that generally seem to plague the field of cybersecurity. I will share with you this framework that I called FORC and um, also some best practices. So things that you can do if you're running, working in a civil society organization in the region, and maybe your organization hasn't devoted any time or resources to cybersecurity issues or protections. Um, hopefully this section of the presentation will give you some ideas for places that you can begin that are hopefully not expensive, not particularly resource intensive, but things that we know from evidence are bound to have a big impact, basically good places to begin. Finally, in the final section of the presentation, I'll share a little bit of um, some follow-up resources, maybe places that you can go to after the end of this webinar, some thoughts on contributing to the larger cybersecurity community. And um, I wanna leave about half an hour for questions just for us to have an open dialogue and open back of, back and forth. As I mentioned, um, it's far more interesting for me to listen to you speak than to listen to myself. So um, I'm really eager to answer your questions and to also hear some of the thoughts that you have on your mind. So with that out of the way, let's just go ahead and begin. All right, as I mentioned, I've prepared a couple of case studies and um, I've chosen one from each country in the region um, represented here. So. First, I thought it would be interesting to talk about um, Khadija, I'm probably mispronouncing her last name very badly, Ismail Leva. She is a really dogged um, investigative journalist in Azerbaijan um, who was put under house arrest. Um, in June 2021, she was allowed to leave the country because of health issues. And as soon as she left the country, she met with partners who conducted some digital forensics on her phone, and it was discovered that her phone was targeted with the Pegasus spyware um, built by um, an organization called the NSO Group in Israel. And the Pegasus spyware is a very invasive kind of spyware. It can basically take control of your device um, with, with without your knowledge or awareness. It works through what's called the zero-click um, technology. So you don't even actually have to click on a suspicious link. Um, it can just be deployed on your device remotely. And the entities controlling it can turn on your um, camera at will. They can listen in um, through your microphone. They can send um, information to themselves about where you are, your location data. They can access all the messages on your phone. They can look at the emails that exist on your device. Um, it's a, it's incredibly invasive, and we know that a number of journalists, including Khadija here, have been targeted with it. Um, I should just say also, you know, at the outset of all of this, that I share these case studies not to scare us. Um, I think that can sometimes be a natural reaction when listening to case studies, when listening to reports from the region. Many of these things are for sure very invasive. They can seem very scary, but just rest assured that um, I'm mentioning these more so to motivate us and to motivate us to take cybersecurity threats seriously and to encourage us to invest the time and resources in trying to protect ourselves. So anyway, this um, case study from Azerbaijan is one I want to share. Um, this Operation Silent Watch, um, it was a remote um, desktop surveillance operation that was launched in Azerbaijan and in Armenia. It was basically a tool for remote access and desktop surveillance. And this report stated that the threat actors behind these attacks, basically the people targeted, um, have been targeting human rights organizations, dissidents, and independent media in Azerbaijan for several years. And um, this is a recent report um, from February 2023. And this is the first time that there was indication that the attackers were also targeting um, 
entities in Armenia, um, including corporate environments. Again, this is a remote desktop access tool. So being able to view, access um, a desktop computer remotely. Um, this report from Amnesty International from 2021 in Belarus um, about blocking leading online media outlets um, and Amnesty concluded that this was um, a brazen attack on freedom of expression. Um, this was, um, perhaps this is a website that some of you access. Um, um, I don't know what it's called colloquially on, you know, on the ground among people in Belarus, but the website um, touch.by is evidently one of Belarus's leading independent media outlets. Um, and Amnesty concluded that this was a crackdown on independent voices. And it's estimated that half, about half of internet users in Belarus use this website for their news to access online fora, to discuss um, topics with other users and other services. And critics have said that the government's attempt to um, shut down this website is also an attempt to stop peaceful dissent and to quiet critics of the government. And as a result, this amounted to a violation of the government's obligations under international human rights law. As you can see from the statement from Amnesty International, um, the blocking of this website is a full-scale assault on the right to freedom of expression and media freedom in Belarus and leaves a gaping wound in the country's access to independent sources of information. Um, and, and we know, I should just mention from um, past work in Belarus, the government in Belarus has acquired surveillance hardware and software from, from many different countries, from Chinese, Russian, American, and Israeli companies. Um, Huawei has been supplying video surveillance systems to the government since, I believe, 2011. Um, and there are existing partnerships with Huawei on the development of 5G technology, including facial recognition, and um, smart mobile checkpoints. Um, and we also know that representatives of the Chinese digital forensics company, a digital forensic cybersecurity company, um, have been training Belarusian officials. So um, this is the shutdown of this website is happening um, amidst a broader kind of um, construction of uh, surveillance in the online and offline world all of which are, um, you know, should be of concern to us as representatives of civil society and, and also people concerned about how we can protect our own and our organization's cybersecurity. This was a report um, published in June of 2023, just about five months ago, documenting attacks on journalists, bloggers and media workers in Belarus from Justice for Journalists. And if you look at the graph on the right, um, you can see that there have been a number of non-physical and cyber attacks um, waged against these media workers. And um, these have been classified. It's a little bit hard to see the different shades of blue, but um, you know, bullying, intimidation in the dark blue, um, the medium blue, breaking into email and social media accounts, phishing and doxing, and the light blue um, seizure of property, access to um, denial of access to information. Um, so we know this is an ongoing an ongoing issue. And perhaps perhaps you're an organization representing independent media journalists in Belarus. Um, hopefully this leaves you wondering what can we do to better protect our information um, in the in the physical world and in the cyber world. All right. Um, this is um, a report from the Council on Foreign Relations on large scale attacks against Georgia. Um, this was an attack called Sandworm. This was um, allegedly from a group in Russia um, and against targets in Georgia. And the incident disrupted the operations of thousands of um, Georgian government services, websites, privately run websites, interrupted um, broadcasts for at least two major TV stations in Georgia. And as a result, directly impacted the Georgian population. And the attack started, we believe, in October 2019. And um, the US government cited Russia as a source of the attack and classified this as, this incident as sabotage. And you may be wondering, you know, what's the purpose of sabotage? Well, 
sabotage helps sow division, it creates insecurity, and ultimately can have the um, outcome of undermining democratic institutions. And as you can see here, it's kind of small, but among the suspected victims, including include the Georgian government, courts, and as they say here, non-governmental organizations, media and business. So perhaps organizations similar to the ones that um, you work in and represent. I should also just say, if in, you know, the spirit of full disclosure, I'm an American citizen and ideally would, um, you know, love to cite completely um, independent reports. And I have tried to do that where possible. It also just happens to be the case that um, government cybersecurity operations often have access to information that um, independent organizations don't. And um, so I realized as an American, it might be might seem strange if I'm citing exclusively or overwhelmingly American government sources. So in an attempt to at least diversify this last claim a little bit, here's also a press release from February 2020 from the British government um, in the spirit of just trying to be as balanced and, and more independent um, and not relying exclusively on American sources. And you can see here the UK government condemns um, Russia over Georgia cyber attacks. And um, in the text of this press release, you can see that um, this resulted in websites being defaced, including sites belonging to the Georgian government, courts, and NGOs. Um, and these are part of a long-running campaign of hostile and destabilizing activity in Georgia. Um, and it's clearly an attempt to undermine Georgian sovere um, sovereignty, to sow discord, and to disrupt the lives of ordinary Georgian people. So as I was just mentioning, um, sabotage of one form or another. Um, many of the websites were defaced with this image of former Georgian president, um, Mikhail Saakashvili, who's shown here. And um, this image was published by the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensics Lab. Um, and I just thought it would be interesting to show because they found um, if you can see here, the corner of this image, a tiny malware signature as part of the image, which is um, what allowed them to conduct some forensics on where this attack may have originated. And while they weren't able to attribute the suspicious activity to a particular source, the malware they found um, behaved in a way that was similar, uh, behaved um, similarly to malware that um, collects users' personal information. So um, there's, you know, a kind of invasiveness to just simply shutting down websites and disrupting operations. There's perhaps something more invasive um, to these attacks than we may, may have initially realized. Um, okay, this is a report from a cybersecurity vendor called um, Trustwave. And um, these targets included organizations based in Moldova. And um, I thought this would be an interesting case study to share. As you can see here, um, a zero day vulnerability in the Barracuda email security. And um, CBE is, um, is, is a reference for, um, it's basically a method for publicly known information security vulnerabilities and exposures. That's what CBE vulnerabilities and exposure stands for. And it's um, basically represents something that enables un unwarranted access. And um, a zero day vulnerability, as they mentioned here in the title is, um, these are very interesting kinds of vulnerabilities. These are vulnerabilities that manufacturers of technologies themselves are unaware of. So let's say I am a technology company and I create a kind of technology. In this case, let's say I create um, an email service a zero day vulnerability is a vulnerability that someone else discovers in my email service that I myself am unaware of. Um, zero day vulnerabilities are for that reason, um, very um, exploitable. And we know that they are exploited. There are gray markets, um, dark markets online on the dark web for even governments purchasing um, zero day vulnerabilities because they can really operate in um, in the darkness. And um, what's interesting is that um, it's believed that against targets in Moldova, the Chinese government used the zero day vulnerability to conduct espionage against victim organizations in at least 16 countries, including Moldova, beginning in October 2022. 
And um, the, if I remember correctly, um, this vulnerability wasn't discovered until um, I think the end of May, May 20th, if my memory serves correctly, May 20th, 2023. So there was a solid, you know, about eight months of this vulnerability being exploited with no one's, uh, to no one's knowledge. And even though a patch to this vulnerability, a fix was deployed right after, I think like even the day after the vulnerability was found, um, the attacker ended up launching additional malware to maintain access to the sources they deemed most valuable. So even though a patch was released to fix the problem, um, the attacker was able to um, roll out other kinds of technologies to maintain their access to at least the targets that they thought were most useful for them. Um, and um, Ukraine, I think, you know, Ukraine has really been um, obviously top of mind, I think, for a lot of us, given the ongoing conflict. And um, there's ample evidence of ongoing Russian information operations to maintain support for the war. And this is a report from um, Google's threat analysis group. And um, this image was taken directly from that report. And um, here they document instances of Russian information operations on Google platforms in 2022, and they've disrupted um, nearly 2000 of them. And um, maybe I'll just pause for like five, 10 seconds if you wanna just look at a few of them. Um, you can see that Google has classified them and um, yeah, an ongoing, an ongoing set of threats in Ukraine. And you can see that in March, 2022, Google announced that they're going to start taking measures to um, try to demonetize and um, block recommendations for Russian state media across their platforms in response to the information operations being conducted. Um, in order to maintain support for the war. And just to say there, Varun, that Anna was also commenting in the chat that ah. the past year, more than 5,000 cyber attacks were carried out on Ukrainian resources. So Anna is from Ukraine. So yeah, that's... Anna, thanks for sharing that. Yes, and Monica, thanks for thanks for mentioning that because I hadn't seen it um, with the chat in the background here. Yeah, um, really good to know. And I think for uh, many of us, it's it's on the one hand somehow shocking, but also not surprising. And um, just, you know, we'll get into this in just a second, but it's, you know, the the nature of war is changing as well. And um, there's not only a physical component, but um, there's the cyber component as well, which we cannot overlook. So, um, you know, why is it that we care about cybersecurity? Well, clearly there are many reasons and hopefully these case studies um, inspired in you some more personal reasons related to your own work as to why we should be caring about this topic. Um, obviously, it's um, of interest for political reasons. Cybersecurity, like all technologies, has a clear political dimension. Um, you know, it, it's not always easy to attribute where the source of a cyber attack is coming from. Um, but we, you know, but we should care when we see that our infrastructures are being undermined or being attacked. Um, maybe your organization is um, an environmental NGO. Maybe you're working on human rights or labor rights. Um, any of those things is deeply political and there are actors out there who are really interested in influencing um, in influencing this work. And we just saw some of those examples um, a few minutes ago. And so perhaps you see yourself among these kinds of entities that could have been targets and perhaps even your, your organization has been um, a target before. Um, and it's interesting nowadays that, you know, as I mentioned, it can be hard to identify um, the attacker. It's hard to attribute an attack to a particular organization, entity, individual, government. But nowadays, um, you know, our adversaries could be anyone from a teenager in their bedroom to an adversarial government. Um, who doesn't agree with your stance on a particular issue. And um, yeah, it makes it makes this work even even harder. So, you know, the reason why we should care about this at the end of the day is that everything that you do depends on 
security in one form or another. Um, if you're trying to protect independent media, poor security practices can risk the effectiveness of your work. Same if you're working on labor rights, environmental rights, human rights, um, whatever it is that you've chosen to focus on. But um, on, on a bright note, good security practices can ensure that that you've taken reasonable steps to advance your organization's goal and your mission. And that's one thing that I hope to communicate today, that um, part of pursuing your organization's goals um, will hopefully after this session involve a little bit of incorporating some cybersecurity aspect. And um, also, you know, if I guess if you were just to think as selfishly as possible, one reason to care about cybersecurity is that ignoring it can be incredibly expensive at the end of the day. And um, yeah, so hopefully we realize that this is worth our time. It's worth a bit of our energy, but it also does not need to be something that we panic over. There are some basic common sense steps that we can take to protect ourselves. Um, and I want to share this image. This is from, this image on the right is from the European Repository of Cyber Incidents. Um, basically, it's um, an independent organization that are tracking cyber incidents across the world, uh, across Europe. And um, you can see here that there are quite a, a, you know, there's a lot of activity in the region, just to say. So I've got a quick question, if it's possible. Is it is yes. cyber, cyber security issues towards that country, like against that country or made by that country? They track yeah. both. They track both. And I believe this, um, I believe this image, uh, the shade of the color of the image is a representation of volume, which includes attacks waged by um, originating from that country towards other countries and attacks that have been waged by other, um, by other organizations, entities outside that country against that country. So this is a macro view, including both. Um, but what's really nice about this repository is that, um, and I believe I may have even included um, a slide for this at the very end. And if not, I can, um, you know, maybe just write down the name and I can also find a way to share it around um, afterwards. But it's called the European Repository of Cyber Incidents. And um, I don't know, let's say you are um, based in Georgia, are interested in trying to better understand um, a history of attacks that have been waged against Georgia. This website makes it very easy to just go in and look at attacks that um, this organization has already collected um, documenting attacks that have been waged against Georgia. And it's really well organized, very thoroughly researched. There's um, a high level summary for each attack. They contextualize it. They provide um, links to sources with information about the attack. I can totally recommend it. Okay, as I just mentioned, you know, ignoring cybersecurity um, can be very expensive. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but maybe we can just fly through it um, about how expensive cybercrime is estimated to be. Um, so these are numbers from a publication called Cybersecurity Ventures. They're based in California. And this is from an article they published about the cost of cybercrime estimated to be $8 trillion dollars, US dollars in 2023. And that's um, really nuts because if, when you think about cybercrime totaling $8 trillion over the course of 2023, that means that boils down to $667 billion every month. Um, these are global, of course, but still I think useful reference points. $154 billion every week, 22 billion every day, 913 million every hour, 15.2 million every minute, and a quarter of a million dollars every second. That to me is really just mind blowing. And that means that if we are to trust these estimates over the course of our 90 minutes together, it's estimated that global cyber crime losses are expected to amount to about 1.4 billion US dollars. Um, I honestly, I just think that's mind blowing. So it's, it's very expensive as well. Okay. You know, part of um, doing this work, I think, it requires that we that we 
change our mindset and, and realize that and try to change the, our own incentives and reward structures. And I realize that this is particularly hard at NGOs when it feels like there's never enough resources or time to get anything done. Trust me, I've been there, done that. Um, but what's good here is that you don't have to do everything all at once. Maybe you can include um, one or two cybersecurity related objectives in your goals for the spring. And maybe next summer you can add one or two more. And um, I would encourage you to include these improvements to your letters to partners and funders and other stakeholders with whom you maintain relationships in private, um, but ideally also maybe refrain from advertising about your improved cybersecurity posture or your cybersecurity investments, because the last thing you want is to talk about all this great work you've done for your cybersecurity, but then to be inviting someone to think, okay, let me see if I can target this, this organization. Um, it's like challenge me guys <laughs> exactly exactly that's the last thing you want to say hey look at me look at all the great cybersecurity work I've done and then you know two weeks later to um, to find yourself trying to clean up a mess from an attack um, oddly enough you know just on a side note this you know this happens a lot in the private sector um, um, you know companies boast about their how you know we take your privacy security we take your privacy and security really seriously and then you know like feels like every other month they are dealing with a cyber breach a cyber attack or leak or hack or event of some sort um and yeah you don't want to find yourself in a similar situation but i wanted to include this slide just to walk through some thoughts on my mind that i think that it's also worth mentioning that Cybersecurity is hard. It's hard everywhere in the world. It's not easy. Um, and I want to share two quotes from um, organizations about the region. This one is from Google's threat analysis group from a report they published on cyber attacks in Ukraine in the context of the war. They wrote, the invasion has triggered a, no a notable shift in the Eastern European cyber criminal ecosystem that will likely have long-term implications for both coordination between criminal groups and the scale of cybercrime worldwide. So in other words, what's happening here is going to have effects for the rest of the rest of the world. It's going to have consequences globally. And this quote from the European Security and Defense Organization on cyber warfare in Eastern Europe, they wrote, still the current Eastern European cyber warfare experience re represents our chance to understand and adapt to modern cyber operations, adding an important dimension to our understanding of war. This is just a long way of my attempt to say that cybersecurity is hard everywhere um, and Eastern Europe is really on the forefront. I think the nature of the cyber threats that many of you are confronting, they are on, you know, you're on the cutting edge. Um, and so if this feels difficult and challenging, I think there's some comfort, if you can call it that, to take from acknowledging the fact that what you're dealing with is not something that we like see in a textbook every day. It's not something that's like basic. It's not, it's certainly not easy. Um, it's hard, it's hard everywhere. And it's particularly challenging in the context that you're all navigating. Um, and I think that's worth acknowledging. And um, perfect, perfect cybersecurity is impossible to achieve. And, um, and, and even if you had an unlimited budget and all the time and people in the world, there's no way to ensure perfect security. You know, the, the most powerful governments, the most keen and clever governments who are intent on penetrating our cybersecurity defense, you know, investments, they will find a way. Perfect security is impossible, just like it's impossible to live without any risk. You know, if we go out and cross the street, we're subjecting ourselves to risk. The same is true in cyberspace. But my acknowledging that cybersecurity is hard everywhere and, and, and that, Eastern Europe, that Eastern Europe is on the forefront and that perfect security is impossible to achieve is by no means a justification to say that we shouldn't try. Um, there's a lot that we can do. And um, there's this idea in cybersecurity called defense in depth. And defense in depth basically puts forward this idea that um, the the attacker, you know, the, uh, us. Maybe the easiest way to explain this is to say that we are trying to defend our own cybersecurity um, 
there our own cybersecurity and defense in depth states that an attacker has to get through every single layer of protection that we have built around ourselves. So perhaps there's a kind of advantage that those of us playing a defensive role have because um, even if an attacker manages to get through one layer of protections, we can surround ourselves with many layers of protections. And so through this kind of defense in depth, um, we may be able to shift the odds in our favor, so to speak, when it comes to thinking about how we can um, protect ourselves in cyberspace. And so basically, if you have an attacker, this red arrow here, trying to penetrate your own systems, um, if you build like several layers of protection around yourself, um, you being the blue monitor here, um, you can build a kind of defense in depth as well. All right, so what are our goals for today? I realize we're quite a ways into the session already to just be talking about this, but um, I hope to, I hope that you can leave the session with some information about threats and trends that are happening um, in the region. Um, I want you to also leave with some ideas for next steps you might be able to take. Um, suggest ideas that you and your organization might be able to adopt that, um, that you can use. Obviously, you're best suited to decide what makes sense for you and what aligns with your own values and your own kind of context and risk, but maybe just give you some beginning places, some, some beginning steps. And, um, and obviously, you know, I want to leave time for, for questions at the end. And we're all navigating these decisions with a different set of values and priorities and risks. And so what makes, what might make sense for me might not make sense for you. Um, but hopefully you can leave with some, some ideas. And like I said, I'm very keen on hearing from all of you as well. So I want to leave, leave some time for, for questions. Okay. And, and you might be wondering like, who in the world am I? And why am I here talking to you about this? I'm Varun. And I have basically split my career between um, working in the private sector and doing public interest technology work. Um, I started my career working at Dropbox um, and I worked on, um, I worked with the security team during my time there. Most recently um, I was working on the data science team at an online radio company called TuneIn and working at the moment as an independent consultant with some private sector organizations. And the other half of my career has been invested in the public interest world, um, working on, um, the influence industry, we called it data and politics, basically trying to understand how our personal data is used for political influence at an NGO based in Berlin called Tactical Tech. I'm an advisor to an organization called the Real Facebook Oversight Board. It's an independent group of thinkers that are trying to provide some truly independent commentary and insight to um, what we believe is much of the damage a company like Facebook is, is doing in, in you know, parts of the world. And um, I'm also working as um, a pro bono um, campaign advisor to some political candidates in different parts of the world who are running political campaigns. They're running for office, um, for example, and they're interested in how they can run a campaign that respects voters, security, and privacy. Um, and most recently, I've started a master's degree in information and cybersecurity because one of my goals looking ahead is for me to help um, civil society organizations like your own um, improve their own cybersecurity. And so that's one of the big reasons I'm really interested in trying to understand um, more about um, the circumstances and needs all of you have. Okay, so let's jump into this. I realize that we are, um, there's still a lot of the present, a lot of the presentation to go through. So um, I don't know if I can speak much faster than this, but maybe buckle up. This is going to be a drinking from a fire hose, but we will get through it because I want to make sure that we respect the time at the end for, for questions and discussions. Just to say, don't go too fast. Don't forget that, you know, you're probably, you and Simon are probably the only native English speakers. So. Yes, yes, I know, I know. I, I was thinking about this because I saw Anna's comment at the beginning and I will, maybe I think what I will do is I'll skip over some sections that are, um, that can save us some time. 
And I also don't think I'm physically capable of speaking much faster than this, thankfully. <laughs> okay, so um, talking about recent threats and trends, I thought it would be informative for you to just have an idea of what's big in the world of cybersecurity now. What kinds of attacks are we seeing? Um, this is a this is a screen this is a graph from a report published by Verizon. Every year they publish um, a report called the Data Breach Investigations Report, a re resource I can totally recommend, in which they snapshot what's happening um, among cyber incidents. Um, and what's really convenient is that they provide insights industry by industry, and um, it's a great overview of trends in the field. And here they show an increasing in pretexting attacks. Um, pretexting attacks are attacks in which threat actors ask victims for certain information, stating that they need it to confirm the victim's identity. And in reality, the attacker will um, steal that information and then use it to carry out other attacks, like identity theft, for example. And um, as you can see, there's been a sharp increase in the number of pretexting attacks. Um, in the last year. Um, phishing is a big scam. These, I thought I'd, you know, instead of talking about what exactly it is, maybe just show a few examples. Um, th these are all real world examples. Um, these are basically, you know, text, emails, communications we get that are trying to lure us in, in one way or another. So you can see here, hi, I am Miss Blank. I just retired from teaching piano and I'm looking for a good student or teacher that is interested in having my Steinway grand piano for free. If you're interested, just drop me a text on this number and I'll get back to you. Um, that sounds too good to be true. And um, it probably is. Um, this, you know, the person who sent this email is probably interested in trying to build some trust with a very trusting and and easy to you know maybe naive subject and maybe build a relationship with them and try to extract information from them that they can use for their own purposes this is an this is a phishing email um that um microsoft um that, that that's intended to look at like it's coming from microsoft um, and what's so nuts about this is that the email looks so real. And if you were to click the link, which in the case of phishing emails, you never want to do. If it looks suspicious, never click on any suspicious links. Um, in this case, if you were to do so, even the website that this takes you to was made to look like a real Microsoft website. They designed these things to look as authentic as possible to exploit our trust. Um, and on this um, fake website that they had created, you are asked to log in to, I think, your Microsoft account. Uh, but in reality, your credentials are then handed over to an attacker. So um, as you can see here, this is a security alert, which is, you know, particularly awful because it we're used to seeing security alerts and trusting them. Um, but here they say we've detected something unusual about a recent sign-in from a Microsoft account. Um, to keep you safe, we've blocked access to your inbox. Please review recent activity. To regain access, you need to go here and log in. Um, this, again, an example of phishing. No, phishing doesn't have to be just over email. It can also happen over other online communication media. And so... Um, here is a screenshot from mobile phishing attempts. Hey, Jason, it's John. I just got a new number. Very convenient to be using such a common name, of course. Um, I hate to bother you, but I'm out of town and I just got into a car accident, exploiting our willingness to trust and help people. Um, I'm okay, but I'm at the hospital. I need $200 to get back home. You know, obviously trying to just shamelessly get money from someone. Um, and, and, um, of course this person is rightly asking, how can I know it's really you? And then the attacker is saying, oh, look at this link to a photo that we had together. I mean, nowadays that's like really not hard to do. You know, maybe you could just link someone trusting to an Instagram photo, I guess. Um, you know, this is, this is quite 
hopefully not not an attack that we would fall for. But anyway, this kind of stuff still happens. It's just kind of a shameless scam. Of course, you know, um, yeah, a number that we don't recognize, a generic name, asking for money, this kind of link um, that also, you know, I'll talk about this later, but this is an HTTP link, not HTTPS. And um, when you see a link that begins with HTTP, um, you're not guaranteed that the communications sent over that website are encrypted. Um, so this is a little bit of a red red flag as well. I thought it'd be nice to um, I can't I can't read this. Um, it's in Russian, um, I believe, but um, um, but in this case, a Russian-based threat actor called Cold Driver was accused of targeting several U.S.-based NGOs, think tanks, um, and a Ukrainian defense contractor with credentials of. Um, um for fishing you know credential fishing and um it was also um for the first time recently um observed to be targeting the military of many eastern european countries including um, the nato center for excellence um so anyway an example from from the region many of you can probably read this while i while i can't but um i thought i would show it as well um, this is an, another another example of just credential phishing and landing pages. You um, supply your credentials, go to a website, and that website is uh, made to look like an authentic, legitimate website, um, where in reality, those credentials are just handed over to an attacker. Um, this is the report. This is a screenshot. Excuse me, screenshot from Google's Frog of War website, and um, you know. They document phishing campaigns targeting Ukraine, and you know you can see that basically there's a lot there's a lot of activity. Malware as well. Um, this is a report from Amnesty from March of this year in which they um, identify a new hacking campaign um, linked to a company that's distributing malware. Um, in this case, this was a malware exploiting a zero day attack. Once again, an attack that the manufacturer didn't know existed, but the attacker found and then exploited for their own purpose. In this um, report from Amnesty um, that they published in partnership with Google, users were being sent messages saying, you missed your parcel. And then with a link to um, to, to a landing page um, that was sent via text to iOS and Android users, and when the link was clicked, they were redirected to a page to submit their information. And um, what was really um, tricky about this was that when users submitted their information, they were first directed to website A, um, which was used by the attacker to continue their exploit. But then they were quickly redirected to website B, um, which was the legitimate website that you would expect to arrive at from submitting this information. So this all happened almost without even your ability to see it. But um, you know, you were you were taken to a website that you would expect to be taken to, but on the way there, you were um, taken to an attacker's website for them to exploit the information that they were able to collect from you. Okay, for the sake of time, I will just. Um, um, skip through these, um, basically a lot of malware distribution. This is a big trend that's happening. Also, um, being distributed via social media accounts. Um, there was a spike in malware distribution around the time of the pandemic. It was a prime time to be doing this kind of attack because of course, a lot of us were online a lot more than we usually were. Um, Google has found that there's been this growth of this hack for hire industry where, um, you know, these are, yes, you can see job descriptions and, um, and attackers are even promised 25% of the revenue from hijacked um, information that they're able to obtain. So um, a lot of this exists because of the economic model. There's money to be made from this kind of, from this kind of stuff. And then ransomware as well. Basically, as you can see here, all the important files on your disk were encrypted. You can no longer access them. Um, and um, you can only get them back if you pay us money. 
this is also um, a trend as well. So, okay, with those case studies out of the way, those high level views of what's happening, um, the question remains, what can you do basically? And um, there's this one way of thinking that I like to call um, fork with a C, as you can see here, that says, you know, there are ways in which you can fortify your online presence. You can obfuscate it, you can blur it. You can, one of the ways you can protect your cybersecurity um, is to reduce your reliance on digital um, resources to begin with. And you can also compartmentalize as well. You can package them up. So let's just go through these briefly. Um, you can use a VPN. Um, at the end of the day, um, a VPN is useful um, only if you trust the VPN provider. Many people ask me what I use. Again, what I use might not be right for you, but if you're interested, I use Proton VPN. This is released by the group Proton. I trust them a lot for my own private and professional work. And um, using a VPN, this allows you to kind of disguise some of your um, internet communications to make it look like you are, let's say, accessing the internet from the United States when you're actually in Belarus, for example. Um, you can um, password protect sensitive documents and files. Um, you can ensure that your um, Wi-Fi settings are settings that um, enable decrypt en encryption, excuse me, which is more secure than older protocols that um, don't by default enforce encryption. And you can also use an encrypted, a secure encrypted email service. These are all ways of um, fortifying your online presence. Um, you know, one of the reasons why using an encrypted email service is important is that um, otherwise, you know, you can think of email communications or other communications that are not encrypted as more like a postcard. You know, when you send someone a postcard in the mail, anyone along the way, the mailman reading it, the person at the post office can read the postcard. That's not very secure. That's similar to unencrypted communications. Whereas if you encrypt your communications online, that's like putting that postcard in an envelope and only the recipient has the ability to open up that envelope. It's much more secure. And so, for example, if you use Telegram, um, there are ways to just, it's literally just two clicks to just start a secret chat on Telegram. And um, that's much more secure than the default um, communication option. Signal is great, which offers end-to-end -end encryption by default. Um, it's preferable to use iMessage over SMS because SMS is not encrypted. Um, these are options for ways in which you can protect your online presence. Okay. Um, you can also blur your um, use of, um, of online services. So you could use DuckDuckGo instead of Google, for example, Tor browser instead of Chrome. These are all options that are available to you. Um, Tackle Tech has released something called the Alternative App Center, which provide some options for you to use more privacy respecting alternatives to many commercially available and popular options, um, some of which are even open source, um, which are beneficial because that gives the, the larger public community a chance to audit these technologies and to ensure that, okay, this technology says it's not, um, says it's encrypting your communications. This gives us a way to audit and to ensure that that's actually happening. Whereas when this, claim is made by a private company, um, no one has access to that code to verify that claim. And also you can compartmentalize. Um, so maybe for some needs, you have a separate phone. Um, maybe you use one browser for um, all of your private internet needs and another for all of your professional needs. Um, maybe you use pseudonyms or nicknames when creating online accounts. Um, these are all ways in which you can divide up your online life into kind of more discrete packages instead of it all being mixed together. Okay, best practices. So maybe we'll spend about 10 minutes going through these and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, one of the best things that you can do is to um, improve your password management by using a password manager. Um, this is hard to see, but maybe something to look at later if you're interested. This has some of the most common passwords around the world. Um, in Germany, you can see here, one of the most common passwords is passport. Um, that's not very secure at all. Um, in Germany, where I am based, um, 
that's, you know, you don't want to find yourself in a situation in which you are vulnerable to a cyber attack because of poor man password management. Um, here are um, the top 100, I presume, you know, English-based passwords. And you can see here, one, two, three, four, five, six is the most common password. Matrix is the 100 most common password. I mean, these are really, you know, all sevens are like the 30th most common password. These are incredibly insecure. And um, password length and the variety of characters in your password, if you're using only numbers or numbers and upper and lower case with letters and symbols, the combination of all these things um, give us a hint as to how secure passwords are. And if your password is even just um, 10, 10 um, characters of only numbers, that is a password that we can break in 40 seconds. Um, whereas if your password is 18 characters long with the combination of all of these letters, numbers, you know, special characters and symbols, that's going to take one quintillion years. So just by adding some, some sound to our passwords, we can make them a lot more secure. And password managers exist for this reason. They help us um, ensure that we have a unique password for every application. Um, they generate these very secure passwords for us. There are The passwords are stored in an encrypted vault. Um, and what's really great is that you only have to remember one password um, and all the other passwords um, are made available to you through the system's password generation. So it's very user-friendly um, and it's something that I can totally recommend. Um, it'll save you a lot of time and um, do a lot to protect your system and services. So I would definitely recommend one of the best places to begin is to roll out a password management system in your organization. And there are a lot of companies out there that offer these kinds of services. I myself, if you're interested, use a company called 1Password. Um, I'll skip this video for the sake of time. Um, another thing that you can do is to roll out multi-factor authentication. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this, but it's good to roll out everywhere you're able to. This means that in addition to just logging in with your password to a service, you might be provided a code on your phone to confirm that you are the one trying to log in. And here you can understand a little bit of how defense in depth is actually being used in practice. If um, maybe my password was compromised, access to my account is still going to be protected through this additional layer of security whether this service is sending me a text message to my phone, whether I have something set up where they, um, through a, another app in which they give me a code, basically I'm protecting myself with another layer of security through multi-factor authentication. This is another place I would highly recommend starting to protect your organization's cybersecurity, every single place possible, um, you know, for your email to, um, you know, calendar services, whatever it is, every place you can enable multi-factor authentication, I would say do it. And, um, you know, there are a lot of things that you can do to ensure that you're navigating the web in a more secure manner. Um, you know, we all leave behind a digital footprint, but we can manage that size of our digital footprint. So you can use a VPN, um, you can use um, add-ons like Privacy Badger, this was released by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, an organization in the United States, to make sure that um, we are um, that that basically disable insecure um, internet connections and plugins. Something I can recommend. Um, oh, oh, sorry, Privacy Badger. Excuse me. Is um, circumvents tracking cookies um, and HTTPS everywhere, which is no longer existing. Um, so it exists, but it's no longer being supported. It's been discontinued. It ensures that our internet traffic is only happening over encrypted channels. Um, a lot of these are, are previewed in Tactile Tech's alternative app store. Um, so I would recommend looking there to some basic places you can begin to ensure that you are securing, that you're browsing the web in a secure, in a secure way. Um, I will skip this for the sake of time. Um, just, you know, basically, opting for more secure communication services using Signal or Telegram's encrypted communication option instead of just basic SMS, for example. Um, and also I would recommend rolling out some internal processes, procedures, and policies. Um, you know, maybe telling your employees about um, 
phishing campaigns, showing them some of the some of these examples, maybe even just showing them some of the examples from this from this um, slideshow. Um, come up with a data retention policy. Back up your data regularly. If you were to have a massive um, incident in two months, uh, how much of the information um, that you have access to today would you be able to easily access? Um, and also just coming up with a basic incident response plan. This doesn't have to be um, rocket science. It doesn't have to be something that you spend months doing. But if you were just to say, okay, let's plan for the worst case scenario, uh, you know, how will we have our data backed up? Where else can we access it? What is the information that we really, really must um, be able to have access to up and running? Do I have people's um, phone numbers so I can contact them? If needed, if our own systems are down, do I have alternatives in place? These kinds of things. And also, you know, if you needed to speak, if you need to make a public statement about something, um, what do you want to be able to say about the common sense steps that you have taken to protect your organization's security? Um, hopefully you can, you can, if something were to happen, you can say, you know, we've rolled out a password manager, we, um, used an encrypted email service, we implemented multi-factor authentication everywhere possible. We did what can be expected of any reasonable organization to secure our own cybersecurity. One thing I would highly recommend is conducting an inventory of all your assets. I will just fly through these now, but just making a list of all of these things um, is going to be very useful, especially if something were to happen down the road. List of endpoints here means um, all of the desktops, laptops, servers, mobile devices that your organization uses. Okay, finally, I would just encourage, um, you know, whether for your own organization, part organizations, if things happen, to contribute to the community. You know, I will coordinate and see if there are ways in which um, my, perhaps my information can be made accessible to you, but, um, you know, there's so much research out there that is not very geographically representative. And especially given the importance of this region, I think it's very important that the broader cybersecurity community benefits from knowledge about what um, about what all of you are dealing with um, if things were to happen. And so, like I mentioned, the Verizon data breach investigations report, a lot of the evidence that they uh, that they research here is, um, you know, based on North America, Europe, the Middle East. Eastern Europe is not very re well represented. And, and you know, industry professionals um, take this kind of work very seriously. It'd be great to see regions like Eastern Europe better represented here. So I would encourage you to, um, you know, share information about things that you see, you hear about experience firsthand with these kinds of research organizations um, and publications. And you can see here um, from the 2020 report, um, we're looking at, um, uh, you know, North America, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, um, Europe and the Middle East, Asia Pacific, um, there, you know, Eastern Europe doesn't seem to have its own light or, or isn't really even, um, well represented when you look at the volume of incidents reported. Um, yeah, and they even asked for better diversity of data contributors. So I would encourage you to, when things happen, when you hear of things, to try to connect with the relevant organizations. Um, also, cybersecurity is basically a team sport, so to say. Um, we, um, you know, if we all um, invest in this together, we can create protections for the larger civil society community. And um, and I would also recommend, you know, if there are particular companies, entities that you depend on. Um, heavily to build relationships with them now before something could happen down the road. Um, you know, just as an insurance policy for yourself, it's always better to have an existing relationship. Let's say um, your email provider, um, something that I could imagine that you rely on really heavily. I would just um, find a contact at that organization. And it's important for them to also know that, okay, um, you know, we have a civil society organization in this part of the world using our service. And um, if they hear of incidents, it's important for them to be aware of uh, the fact that you're using their service and they can pass along information that's relevant to you if they learn of information that um, could be of interest. So anyway, I would just say build relationships, establish context, contacts for um, people 
helping run the technologies on which you depend. Anyway, I'll just fly through these follow-up resources. Uh, there's something called the Center for Internet Security. It's a nonprofit based in the United States that has a list of um, where to begin when you're thinking about your own cybersecurity. Um, and it's, I think, a list maybe of 18 places, CIS Control 1, Control 2, I think maybe it's like 18. Um, and these are like listed in order of what they think is like the best place to begin, second place, place second best place to begin, and so on. And it's all very evidence-based. A really good resource to look at if you're new to thinking about these things. Um, this is a bit dated, a resource from Tackle Tech called Security in a Box. I can absolutely recommend it's available in a number of different languages. Um, this is a blog post from Civicus with eight tips for civil societies, digital defense. Um, just a short blog post I can recommend. Um, project Shield, this is a project from Google. Um, ideally, this would be an open source solution that I thought was worth mentioning that Google has some services to help um, human rights organizations, election related websites from DDoS attacks. These are distributed de denial of service attacks. These are basically attacks in which attackers um, can take down your website. And so Google has Project Shield available in which it can absorb much of the burden that attackers might wage against their own website. Um, like I said, ideally this would be open source, but um, here we are, it's Google. Um, but I still think it's a resource worth mentioning. And if you feel like it's um, a company and resource that you trust and can rely on, um, given what your organization does, can absolutely be a resource um, worth using. Okay, I'll skip this for now. I mentioned this earlier, the European Repository of Cyber Incidents, um, great dashboard, highly interactive. Um, yeah, anyway, I will just skip this for now. And um, also I reached out to Proton, um, like I mentioned, I use them a lot for my own email communications, for my own professional communications. And um, this is not a paid sponsorship at all, um, totally unpaid. I just reached out to them out of interest. And I asked if they offer discounts to um, nonprofit organizations, to non-governmental organizations. And even though it's not widely advertised, they told me, yes, they do. They offer a 50% discount from their retail um, prices to support nonprofits. And so... Um, they support really user-friendly email communications, calendar, um, cloud services, a VPN. And I believe they might even be having a big sale going on right now. So um, if you're interested, this could be something that you're worth, uh, th that's worth your time looking into. Um, and um, perhaps I can even put you in touch with the contact that um, the person I, I directed my inquiry towards who provided me with the information that, yeah, they they do offer a discount, even though it doesn't seem to be broadly advertised. Um, anyway, totally unpaid. I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but I thought um, if you are thinking about, you know, how can we revamp some of our basic internet communications, um, uh, you know, internet infrastructure um, could, be, could, be an could be an option for you to think about. Okay, I'll stop. I realize we have maybe only about 15, I'm happy to, 15 minutes for questions. I'm happy to stay on a bit longer. Um, but just want to say thank you, and um, I'm eager to hear um, more from all of you and to learn from you as well. Thank Thanks. you so much, Varun. So we have um, we have three questions in the Q and A. I'll start with those, and then there were some comments also uh, in the chat, which I wanted to to make everyone aware of. But maybe we start with the question from Murab. So th this was uh, quite early on uh, during the the presentation uh, when you were showing, I think, different tracking um, methods and tracking apps. And Murad is asking, could you please tell us how we can detect detect these tracking apps and how we can remove them from our devices? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so I would say um, the first thing to do is to, it's something that we all see. Um, you know, when you go to a website, um, you always see that cookie banner, you know, like do you accept, do you agree to the terms here? It's like a massive pain. It's like really a pain, but um, I would say it is always worth the extra 10, 15 seconds to go in and to click like, alternative or more information and to only agree to the functional cookies, the cookies that are absolutely necessary for the website to function. Um, when you, usually when you just click on accept all, 
that is when the website is authorized to place a lot of tracking cookies um, onto your device. And these are cookies that are very invasive. And this is how at the end of the day, like, you know, if you're talking to a friend of yours about something really random, like, I don't know, sporting events happening next year, and then you open up, you know, a new website or Instagram, whatever, and then you see an ad for that thing. Um, and, and I think we've all been there. It's like, how in the world did this happen? The reason at the end of the day that happened is through these tracking cookies. Um, that is the technology at the end of the day that enables um, online advertising companies, which at the end of the day is what big, many big internet companies are, Google, Facebook. That's, that is what allows them to track us online. So first I would say, say no to, to cookies when, when you have the option. It's kind of a pain, I know, but um, it's a thing I would recommend. And also there are add-ons like um, Privacy Badger that I just mentioned, um, internet plugins that you can just install in your browser, just a few clicks that will disable um, invasive cookies by default without extra work on your end. That's something that you can do. That's, I'd say, step number two. And, and step number three, I would say, is um, to opt for services that don't even have an interest in putting tracking cookies on your device to begin with. So like, you know, um, um, yeah, open source communications or, you know, I, I often recommend using a communication service like Signal, um, which I think is kind of like the gold standard if you need to text someone um, as opposed to like Facebook Messenger, for instance. If I could just add very briefly, um, that those are the first three things I would begin, you know, go through the cookie clicking notifications, privacy badger and opt for services that are more privacy secure to begin with. And then fourth, um, you know, if you have the resources and the time, it's probably worth um, trying to partner with a specialist and like, you know, device security, digital forensics to actually be able to run an audit on your physical device and um, on the device of your colleagues to see if there's evidence for more invasive tracking that could actually be happening. When I mentioned Khadija at the very beginning, this journalist from Azerbaijan, who was authorized permission to leave the country for health issues, that's how, you know, that's when she physically met face to face with some specialists and um, digital forensics who ran forensics on her physical device when they realized that she had been targeted with Pegasus. So um, obviously that's more resource intensive, but if that's an option available to you, it's something I would recommend as well. There is, um, going back to our Q&A, there is a question from Merab. I don't know whether you have that information, Varun, or not. He's asking if you know what percentage of the uh, money that is lost to cyber crime is subsequent, is, is, is recovered afterwards. So do, do you have any idea how much of that is actually recovered? It's really hard to, uh, the short answer is I have no clue. Um, um, Part of what's so hard about this, I think, is that a lot of cybercrime losses, um, you know, can occur without people's even own knowledge. You know, like, you know, someone's um, identity could be exploited, could be stolen. Someone's stolen identity could be, you know, used for quite a long time before it's actually discovered. Um, and maybe in many cases, it's not even discovered to begin with. And that's part of what's so um, so sinister about a lot of cyber um, about a lot of cyber crime. Um, you know, it's interesting. There is um, a growing industry. Uh, it's actually growing quite quickly of cybersecurity insurance, um, in which organizations will purchase insurance, kind of like fire insurance or health insurance, to protect themselves. I um, have done a bit of research on the cybersecurity insurance industry, and I thought about maybe including information about it here. But to be honest, the evidence about the industry is not so promising. And uh, for that reason, I would not recommend um, going out of your way to purchase a cybersecurity insurance policy today. Maybe in five years, things will be different. But, um, but just to say that that is one mechanism that some companies have used to protect themselves. But in reality, it seems that... Um, when cybersecurity incidents happen, it seems to be the case that very, very, very rarely are insurance companies actually providing the resources for these companies to get some financial benefit and claw back uh, from the losses they suffered. So um, I have no idea how much of that, how much of that money is actually recovered.
And I would be interested to see, you know, what kind of products you have in terms of cybersecurity insurance. If you you go and say, you know, we're a civil society organization from Belarus <laughs> or from, from Ukraine, who would, would say, yes, okay, you know, we have a product for you, uh, cybersecurity insurance. I, I find it, I think it would be, yeah, uh, kind of a whole different situation compared to maybe some other commercial um, entities that you have in, in other countries. Um, Sure. A very concrete question from from Mariam. Um, could you please reiterate the name of the browsers uh, of the browser that was more secure um, than Chrome? Yeah, definitely. You know, there are many options here. I apologize. I was um, just speaking so so quickly, but um, I you know I use Firefox. I um, you know it's, it's built by Mozilla. Um, I think it's um, a great, very privacy respecting browser that's also very user friendly. Um, there's also um, DuckDuckGo has um, a browser as well that um, also tries to disable invasive tracking cookies by default. This is another option. What's also nice about this browser is that um, you know, by default, when you search for something, it searches through DuckDuckGo and not through Google. So um, that's another alternative. And um, I would also say, depending on your needs, or perhaps you're trying to investigate something that's very sensitive or something that, um, you know, depending on your context, you really want to make sure is not tracked at all, Tor browser, T O R. I can put the names in the chat. Um, so we have we have a question from Maya. Maybe this is something that um, needs we we need to follow up after um, the webinar because it's a very complex question. Mm -hmm. If you have any, uh, well, she was, first of all, she was saying thank you for the interesting presentation, but also asking if you could share more sector specific information, for example, big data leakages from civil society organizations mm -hmm. and the impact on their projects and beneficiaries. Absolutely. This is not information I have handy just immediately, but um, it's a really good question because especially in the last few years we have seen um greater and greater you know we have seen more and more evidence that civil society organizations themselves are being attacked and that's part of what i was trying to communicate at the very beginning with the case studies that were specific to the region and specific to civil society organizations but um it could be um a, also maybe a great collaborative project um, for us here, you know, to, to kind of compile, um, you know, resources, reports related to um, cyber incidents that have been, um, that's, that have been targeted against civil society organizations. The, the whole slideshow has like many images, graphs from reports um, it, with civil society organizations that were targeted, but um, in terms of specifically big, big data leakages, I can't um like like I assume you're asking if uh, if the civil society organization itself suffers from a big data leak um this is something that I off the top of my head cannot think of examples of um one of the reasons for this is that um often it, you know when you think about the economics of these kinds of events um if there's information that an attacker wants to exploit, they um, usually want to um, profit from that information. And by making this, by leaking this information, by making it publicly accessible, they um, they ruin the opportunity for themselves to profit from it. So let's say they are able to get hold of, I'm just making an example of all the credit card information for people working at a given civil society organization. They don't want that information to be leaked. They want only themselves to have access to it. Um, but I'm sure there have been many, I'm sure there have been many incidents of um, sensitive information being leaked from civil society organizations themselves. I don't have any off the top of my mind or just at my disposal, but I, it's for sure happened. Um, but I, I just can't think of any off the top of my mind. 
then maybe Baron, if you're if you're okay with that, we can uh, also put Maya in contact with you directly to see if there there are some some things that maybe you can share with her. Um, because I absolutely I wouldn't be able to <laughs> come up with this just like that. Um, totally. Uh, Murad is is asking. Uh, how can you clean the sort of the cookies that you would like to get rid of and how often should you be definitely um i'd say this is a personal decision at the end of the day but um i you know gosh this is this is really more a matter of preference than anything else um and it also depends on the kinds of cookies that you're erasing you know for example um some websites um, you know, when you log into a website, for example, and you you see that box to tick that it says, remember me, um, that's, you know, that information is encoded as a cookie. So the next time you visit that website, it remembers, okay, here's your username, here's your login, we can keep you logged in. So that's really a matter more of um, personal, um, personal taste. But if you, you know, if you want to be as, um, you know, privacy conscious as possible, um, secure as possible. There's truly nothing preventing you from doing it, not only every day, but every hour. Um, maybe, you know, maybe a more realistic um, thing to do is you could just say at the end of Friday night, at the end of workday Friday, I will just clear all my cookies at the end of the week before starting the new week. That could be a good, a good rule of thumb. But like I mentioned, I think in practice, this will depend on um, the risks that you're navigating. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. We still have three questions in the Q and A and some comments in the chat. So, um, in the Q and A, um, you are being asked for recommendations on safe workspaces or apps that should um, that we should use for keeping and managing organizational records, such as personal data of coworkers, contractors, alumni, etc. What would you recommend for that? Yes. So, uh, um, perhaps. I I'm I can't just off the top of my mind like recommend a particular service, but what I you know like company X to company Y product management tool X or Y, but um, what I can definitely for sure recommend is that whatever tool you use to ensure that it it lives in an encrypted space. So um, I let me just put myself in in your shoes for now. If I were to have a document with the personal data of all my coworkers, I would create a file on Proton Drive. This is encrypted, this is very secure. And, um, you know, I could even password protect that, that resource. Um, and yeah, this is something that I would, that I would do to, you know, create a, um, um, a resource that's that's encrypted that's not easily accessible another alternative i mentioned for example i use one password for my password management um it's also you could you can also use it as an encrypted vault and um what's convenient about this is that there are ways that you can set up shared resources on a service like one password and so if you want to share this set of information with a few other employees you could and so you can create shared nodes secure nodes and documents um, you can save secure notes and documents directly there. And um, what's important, I think, is that um, whatever whatever service you use to create that, wherever you you put that information, whether it's a Word, Microsoft Word document, for example, or a document on the cloud, that it ultimately lives in a home that's encrypted, that's end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, so, you know, there are also ways, they are a bit more involved, but there are ways to um, partition, to divide up your hard drive on your machine, for example, and to encrypt, um, encrypt, you know, your hard drive. And so even if you're documenting all of this on a Microsoft Word document, you can ensure that this lives in an encrypted home. I'd say, regardless of the tool that you use to document this information, the important thing is that it binds itself into a home um, that's fully encrypted. Thank you, Varun. I think uh, Maya was reacting to the question from Mariam on um, more secure and privacy-oriented browser, and she's mentioning Brave. Yeah, Brave is another option. I was actually thinking about mentioning it. Um, Brave is another option for sure. Yeah, so just maybe for, for the others to be made aware of. It wasn't really a question. Um, okay. 
a last a last question from Merab. So um if you could comment on recent trends for passwordless security, where the service provider sends you a one-time code for a, uh, authentication and it works, uh, that works for a, a limited amount of time, limited time. Yes, you know, this is a, this is, it's it's interesting. There's a lot of, um, I'm sorry, I just need to adjust myself. I'm seeing the sun for the first time in like what feels like weeks in Berlin. <laughs> um, um, this is a trend that's happening um, Quite, you know, there, there are a lot of moves towards password less security, not only in the context that you asked, Murad, but um, I think it was, was it Murad asking the question? Merab, 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 Merab. sorry, Merab asked the question, but also like um, biometrics, for example, services where you just like scan a fingerprint and log in, um, you know, when, um, so from the point of view of the service provider, from the point of view of the company that runs the service that you're trying to log into, um, this is in some ways easier for them because, um, it, um, you know, le instead of your logging in with a username and password specific to the website, um, and then, you know, let's say you have multi-factor authentication enabled, getting a separate code delivered to you, um, you know, on your device to verify that you are the one logging in. Did, and, and more password less security in which they're just emailing you a code um it simplifies things for them the disadvantage for you though is that that means that your access to this account is being controlled entirely by your email itself and so that means that um let's say you have two options for accessing an account one is like passwordless security one is let's say the traditional way and passwordless security, if an attacker gets access to your email, they also will have access to that account. Um, and any other service that is operating through passwordless account access, that's that's really bad for you. Um, the traditional version is that you have your username and password and ideally also multi-factor authentication enabled. Um, even if the attacker were to have access to your email, they might not know your account specific password um, and they also um, hopefully would not have access to your uh, multi-factor authentication service. Let's say that you receive a text or a code on your phone. Um, sometimes these multi-factor codes are sent via email, but even if that multi-factor code were to, were to be sent via email, they would still not have access to your account-specific password. Um, and so in that and that way of thinking, the traditional way of accessing this account is preferable for you because it's more secure. Um, however, it's not um, as easy for the company because of course now the company has to hold, manage a whole password um, login system. So there's a lot of this move towards passwordless security because it's easier for the technology providers themselves, though not necessarily um, more secure for you. So I would recommend, you know, where possible, trying to think about this, trying to think about things in terms of defense and depth and trying to think of how can I make the access to this account as difficult for, you know, an adversary as possible. I realize in practice, that means that it might not be as convenient. It might require a few extra steps, but also acknowledge, see those extra steps as a kind of investment that you're taking in protecting your own online security. Yep. I think we have only two uh, comments slash questions remaining in the chat. Uh, one of them was on VPN uh, because you were mentioning VPN several times, and um, uh, Maravit was again was he was mentioning that actually VPN use is restricted in Belarus. Uh, ah, okay. So, so this this um this of course can can pose problems. Um, I don't know if you would like to comment on, on, on that in any way in terms of maybe alternative approaches. I mean, you are already mentioning different things that can be done, not only VPN, but yeah, so just um, for you to- Yeah, know. yeah, I think, you know, totally. Thank you for sharing that. I myself was not aware of that. It's very good to know, um, you know, and, and something that we see, um, I have at least not seen from the region in particular, but that we have seen in other parts of the world where, um, you know, government officials were institutions that you know institutional power is not a fan of how the internet is being used as straight up just pulling the plug on the internet we've seen internet shutdowns in um, other regions of the world and um 
And, you know, this is also one way in which, um, you know, trying to use the internet in, a, let's say, a, you know, in ways that that some entities would regard disagreeable, in which that's trying to be controlled. So I would say, um, you know, obviously this is not, um, this is not a, this is not a great alternative, but just making sure that you have other ways of communicating, at least with people you would like to communicate with online um, that are not dependent on um, that, like a traditional internet connection and actually, not internet connection, but like additional, you know, web browser based internet connection with a VPN running. So whether that means making sure that you're connected to these people already via signal, via encrypted telegram chats, um, that's not the same, of course, but um, it is one fallback plan of just being able to maintain some basic level of communication, even in an environment in which um, VP, you know, accessing the internet through VPN is restricted. Because of course you can't go access, you know, a news website through Signal or, or Telegram, but um, it is one fallback. And also an interesting thing for me to think about, about it's it's one thing that I think I will I will leave this thinking about how can um, yeah people like you navigating these situations in which VPN restriction in which VPN use has been restricted how can you still go about doing what you need to go about I think that's that is all we've addressed now all questions in the Q and A and everything in the chat and I know we are already running over time so I don't know if any anyone else has any burning questions or comments uh feel free at this stage to just raise your virtual hand and then I'll, I'll give you the floor if not um thank you very much Barun for for the webinar it was um I, I see people were really staying on board and it was really great to see that uh we got uh, a lot of questions and reactions um I we will as we were saying we will follow up with some materials so you don't need to worry about that if you didn't manage to write some of the things down from the chat or or uh, from Barun's presentation we will definitely follow up um, and Barun was just saying in the chat that he's um, happy to be in touch um, so we can uh, we can facilitate that and put you in touch with Barun many many thanks uh, to Barun and to everyone who was uh, staying with us now stop the recording <laughs>